Well, hello and, uh, and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. The topic is what's new in TCP2. I'm Susan Zimmerman, Executive Director of Executive Director of the uh, Secretariat on Research Ethics in Ottawa. And uh, this webinar, which is the first in our new series of webinars on TPS2, is designed for researchers, REB members, and ethics administrators who are already familiar or who were familiar with TCPS uh, in its first incarnation and want to understand what's new in the second edition. So it's not really intended as a general overview of TCPS2, but the focus is going to be on uh, what's new. And uh, this is the topic of our first webinar because it was the one most frequently requested when we uh, went across most of the country doing regional workshops. So we're trying to be responsive to your requests. Um, I'm going to start with some housekeeping. First note that we're using a phone teleconferencing um, for this presentation, and we're in what is called lecture mode. So your lines are muted. You can hear me. I cannot hear you. So feel free to groan and laugh and whatever, eat lunch. Um, the I'm covering, uh, there's a series of PowerPoint slides that go with it, and uh, those are presented to you via Adobe Connect. And I know that many of you can see them because many of you are responding to uh, a poll we've put up. Um, so if you can't see the slides or uh, then uh, if you're having trouble connecting at all, I, I would suggest you first try your own local help people and uh, test your uh, com compatibility with Adobe Connect using the test URL that was sent to you with your registration confirmation. And if, if that doesn't work, then you certainly can contact the Secretariat here. You should have our um, uh, email information and our phone information on the uh, invitation that was sent to you. So uh, we're, we are using, as you can see, a polling feature of Adobe Connect where we open windows with multiple choice questions. And I'll be doing that a few times over the course of this presentation. So the one up now that uh, about 60 of you have responded to is just on whether or not you've completed our new tutorial uh, course on research ethics, or CORE. And I see that most of you have not. So um, that's fine. I would encourage you to try that if you're interested. Um, if you can't see the polling, um, you, it may be that you have your screen set to full screen. If you just click on that and reduce the size of the PowerPoint, you should be able to uh, see the poll, polling question. Um, I'm going to give the presentation straight through, and then we will open a window where you can type in, uh, questions for me uh, at the end. And I, I'm hoping to leave ample time. I've given my colleagues here strict instructions to whip me if I'm not done by about uh, 12.40 or 12.45. So there should be uh, some time for questions, uh, and I will respond to them. Um, vous pouvez me les envoyer en français aussi. Uh, je vais répondre en, en anglais, mais if you want to send them in French, that's fine. There will be uh, a French version of this exact webinar, webinar uh, in one week from today. Uh, I will be presenting that. And both the French and the English webinars will be uh, posted on our website um, in the not too distant future. For, so if you have colleagues who weren't able to attend today, um, they, there will be a chance for them to see it. So I think I'm going to uh, get started now. Um, so I'll close that poll. We'll just begin. Sorry, um, if, just more technical housekeeping. If, if you can see the screen but can't hear me, I, I guess uh, information for how to get in touch. And now I'll begin. Um, the TCPS uh, 2, or the second edition uh, of the TCPS, follows on the original version, which was uh, created in 1998 by the three uh, federal research funding agencies, research agencies. And they are still the, the owners of this document. So when you see references to tri-agency, that is why. Um, and it's designed to be a common document for all forms of research uh, that involve humans. So. 
the further, because it is a tri-agency document, it's not all research involving humans conducted anywhere in Canada, but only that research that is conducted under the auspices of institutions that are eligible for funding by the agencies. Why is it restricted in that way? Because that's the scope of the authority of the agencies. They can't dictate the terms of, um, uh, of, of how others conduct research. In other words, people who uh, conduct research with private funding outside of the university or the academic setting, uh, who have nothing to do with the three agencies, are not bound by the TCPS. But um, we're pleased to see that over the course of the years, p uh, many groups and organizations, uh, including federal government uh, departments that are, by the way, not necessarily bound by the TCPS, have adopted it as their ethical guidance just because it is a, a fairly comprehensive and, and detailed set of ethics guidelines. So it's, it's kind of, its moral scope is, is larger, but its mandatory scope is only uh, research conducted under the auspices of institutions eligible, eligible for agency funding. And this current edition um, was released in December of 2010, so just short of a year ago, hard to believe. And um, many of you may know that uh, this revision is the result of two years of, uh, two and a half years really, of consultation, public consultation across the country. And we hope that it reflects um, many of the uh, hundreds of comments that we received. The first thing I want to say is that although this webinar is focusing on the changes uh, to, that are brought about in TCPS2, it is really a document that has a great deal of continuity with the, the sort of fundamental values uh, that were present in the first edition. Um, and I'm going to just show you another little poll here that I'm going to invite you to, to complete, uh, just for me to get an idea of how familiar uh, those of you on, online today are with the first edition. And you're all voting very quickly. And I'm seeing that m many of you are indeed very familiar with it. Well, some of the things you will not be surprised by or that are not different is the fact that uh, it's based on core principles um, that are based on the fundamental value of respect for human dignity. And while there were eight principles in the first edition and there are three in the second edition, we feel that what we did was take those eight principles and distill them into the, three, the current three core principles, which are very much in line with international ethics um, principles. You would have seen them. Uh, they are similar to principles reflected in the US in the Belmont Report, similar to principles put forward in the Declaration of Helsinki, and other um, sort of seminal research ethics documents. The notion of a proportionate approach to research ethics review was certainly present in the edition uh, and continues to be there in the second. Um, the basic requirements for consent, what is free, informed, and, and ongoing consent, these are not new in the second edition. Um, we, we certainly have updated them. We have certainly have provided more clarity, we hope, and more guidance. But the basic requirements for, for consent are the same. Uh, so is the notion that uh, in order to achieve ethics approval, you have to weigh the, the risks of the research against the potential benefit that it represents. And the notion that you have to protect the privacy and confidentiality of research participants is certainly present, although we acknowledge that in some cases it may, um, it may not be the only consideration. Sometimes people want to be acknowledged for their participation, but the, but the basic sort of default position is you need to protect uh, the privacy and confidentiality of those who participate in research. And certainly the need for fairness and equity in research participation is, a, uh, is an ongoing uh, value that ex that's, was expressed in the first edition and is certainly uh, very much present in the second edition. Chapter one is the basic chapter, and, and just a word about the whole framework. Um, as you may have noticed, the second edition goes from a set of general chapters 
that apply to all forms of research involving humans to, to a series of uh, more specialized chapters towards the end of the document that focus in on issues that are specific to uh, a particular area of research. But, um, it, the, but the core principles are certainly present in the, uh, the core part of the guidance is, is contained in the first, say, seven chapters. And um, even if you uh, go directly to uh, the chapter on genetic research, for example, because you're a genetic researcher, you are still bound by and need to understand and, and have integrated the ethics guidance that's provided um, in the first part of the document. So as I said uh, earlier, we ha have consolidated the core principles. The, these are respect for persons, concern for welfare, and justice. And respect for persons uh, encompasses the notion both of autonomy for those who have the full capacity to consent to research, uh, the principle that we often talk of is autonomy, but that's not enough because of course there are people who do not have autonomy, who do not have full capacity, and yet whose participation in research may be important, important to them, important for research. Um, and so we talk about respect for persons as covering both. Uh, both those elements, both respect for those with autonomy and those who lack capacity. And obviously, different uh, guidance applies where people lack capacity. Concern for welfare is a, is a broad notion that takes into consideration not only physical and mental and, and spiritual uh, well-being, but also the social and economic uh, circumstances that people find themselves in that may uh, that may be important to them as they're considering uh, the potential uh, benefits of research and also uh, the potential harms. Justice, again, a, a principle you would be familiar with if you're familiar with the first edition, because uh, this talks about fairness and equity in research, distributing the benefits and burdens of research equitably, and ensuring that people are, are both permitted to participate in research, that is, they are not inappropriately excluded from research, and also not inappropriately included. Let's make sure that the people who are participating in research are the right people for the right reasons, uh, not because they're a group of convenience or a group that's easily exploited, for example. So that's the principle of justice. And then the proportionate approach, while I mentioned that this concept was present in the first edition, uh, the difference in the second edition is that it is much more fully fleshed out. And we have said that it's a two-tier concept, which means that at, as a first step, uh, when a research ethics board is approaching uh, a study, they need to look at the level of risk presented by this particular study. And that will determine whether the research goes for full board review or whether it may be delegated to one or two people uh, to review. Uh, and then once that determination has been made based on the level of risk, uh, the reviewers, whether it's the full board or just the delegated reviewers, must assess the risks, the benefits, and the ethical implications of that research. And it's not because it's gone to delegated review that it doesn't require serious consideration or, or scrutiny. It simply means that it doesn't require the same, often because the risk level is, is minimal, it doesn't require the same um, diversity of expertise uh, that needs to be brought to bear on that particular uh, study. Chapter 2 deals with the scope uh, and approach uh, that we adopt uh, in TCPS2. And so now I'm going to be focusing not on the chapter as a whole, but just on a, a couple of highlights of changes in the chapter. So we start out by talking about uh, what research is within the scope of REB review and what research is exempt from REB review. And one of the new uh, categories of exemption is research that relies exclusively on secondary use of anonymous information or anonymous human biological materials. Now, um, this is definitely an exemption. If you are only using anonymous information and that's how you're doing your research, you can take a body of data and use it and not go for REB review. But a caution, uh, in this day and age with the technological advances, uh, 
that we have, we know that it is very difficult to categorize a, a body of information as being entirely anonymous. And certainly, particularly if you're linking two bodies of data, which on their own might be anonymous, uh, once you link them, that may render them identifiable, render that information identifiable. So a caution there. Yes, it is an exemption, but if there's any doubt as to, as to the possibility of, of identifiability of that information, you really should be seeking at least some input from the REB as to whether they think uh, that the exemption holds or not. Another entirely new article is uh, the provision on creative practice. This is another exemption. We have said that if you are doing creative practice activities, the use of the, of the fine arts as a form of expression, that's not research and it does not require REB review. However, if you are using creative practice as a research methodology, in other words, you're using uh, the fine arts, whether it's dance or theater or, uh, or, or visual arts, in order to elicit the answers to research questions from participants, then you are covered. That is research that must be, and that must receive REB review. So purely artistic activities do not fall within the ambit of REB review. But the use of creative practice as a research methodology would, would fall under REB review. The chapter on consent is, is obviously of fundamental importance. And so there will be much that is familiar in it. Um, some things that are new, we have added a provision on the disclosure of material incidental findings. So that would be when you are doing research and the purpose of the research is you know, purpose X. But in the course of doing it, information comes to you that has to do with subject Y not the focus of your research, not necessarily something you understand well, but something that may actually be significant to the participant. In other words, it may affect their welfare. Now, this comes up quite frequently or may possibly come up in genetic research where you're studying one condition and yet you find something that relates to another condition. That was not the subject of the consent. That's not what the person kind of signed up for, if you will, but you think that Perhaps it's important for them to know that they have a predisposition to some other condition. We're advising that you, obviously, where the welfare of a person is affected, you need to um, either divulge that information to the participant, because it's significant to them, or if, it's, if you're not sure what it really means, but you think that it may be of significance, consult colleagues, find out who would be able to explain the nature and importance of that uh, information. So there's some, some guidance that we provide in, in Article 3.4 on that subject. Um, certainly the notion of capacity has always been present in the TCPS. What we've done is uh, enhanced our definition of capacity and for the first time included reference to the notion of fluctuating capacity. So capacity is quite a, uh, a complex subject and you know in some cases it's absolutely clear you know you're you're 34 years old you've got all your wits about you you uh, you understand the nature and consequences of the particular research no question you have capacity you're three years old uh, you know you don't have capacity but there are people who, and and of course there are people who have children who have a who are in a state of, of increasing capacity as they mature and become more able to understand complex consequences but there are also people um, who may have capacity and may have a kind of a neurological condition or disorder or mental illness which means that at some points in time they have capacity and at other points they lack it and so that notion of fluctuating capacity is new to TCPS2, and we wanted to acknowledge it so that people are aware as they go into uh, research that you may be dealing with someone who, during the course of a research period, may fall into or out of that ability to consent. And since consent is ongoing, you need to be sure that you have um, covered for that, that there is someone who is authorized on that person's behalf to, con to consent or to uh, make sure that, that there is someone consenting throughout the period of the research. 
We have also introduced the notion of research directives. Um, these do not have legal status. They're not acknowledged in law in the way that, for example, advanced directives are. But it's the same idea, the idea that I today may, uh, for example, have been diagnosed with Parkinson's or diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I may know that there will come a day when I will not have the capacity to consent to research, but I may be very interested in uh, you know, furthering research on Alzheimer's. And I may want to say to those around me or the people who are going to be designated as my authorized decision makers, you know, if an opportunity for research comes up, I, I want to be in. Um, you know, I'm not afraid of that. I, I really want to participate. So uh, the notion of research directives is just the idea that you can tell uh, the people who will be making decisions on your behalf what your wishes are now. Um, so it may not be enforceable in a court of law, but certainly gives them a good indication of, of your own wishes. And um, what we've done in Article 3.12 is underline, and this is a shift, because th there was an impression under the first TCPS that uh, the gold standard for consent was a, a written consent form, a signed consent form. And what we're saying here is, you know, that is often a, a good uh, indication of consent, but it is not the only indication or necessarily the best indication in all circumstances. So what we have chosen to do is focus on the researcher documenting what he or she did to obtain consent, but not necessarily on them producing a signed consent form. In some fields, certainly in, in some types of social science research, in some kind of field work, it may not be uh, feasible, it may not even be desirable for people to be signing consent forms. Um, so what we're saying is the focus is not on having that piece of paper, it's on having gone through a valid process where the person understands, and you can reflect in documentation of your own if you're the researcher, what you did to explain the nature and consequences of the of the research and how that person indicated their consent. So we're just opening it up to being a more flexible uh, notion. In Chapter 4, um, which we have named Fairness and Equity, so this is uh, the circumstances under which one participates in research, and this gets back very much to the notion of justice. We have provided explicit guidance. So it's not that this was not true under the old TCPS, but we have stated explicitly that there should be no inappropriate exclusion of children, the elderly, pregnant, or breastfeeding women. These are all categories that traditionally have been uh, left out of research or may have been, including research that it, the results of which are going to affect them. So. That's not a good idea. If the research is going to apply to children, or if, it's, if the intervention is going to be used on pregnant women, they should be given the opportunity to participate. So it's not that you must include absolutely everyone in every form of research. It's that you shouldn't be inappropriately excluding people, and you should be looking at what the right uh, target group is for your research. So no inappropriate exclusion, and as I said before, not also not inappropriate inclusion. And this is where the notion of vulnerability comes up. And in the past, uh, there's been a tendency in some research ethics documents to focus on a vulnerable status of a group. So an entire group has been categorized as vulnerable. That's, um, to some extent, the American approach. They talk about pregnant women as being vulnerable or children as being vulnerable. And I think we can agree that uh, all of us at different times may present in vulnerable circumstances. So what we want to do is focus on what are the circumstances. Maybe that for certain types of research, um, you know, a 14-year-old is really not vulnerable. It depends on the level of risk and whether they're truly a, in, in a circumstance to understand fully what it is they're uh, is, is being offered to them. Same thing for pregnant women. I would not like to think that all women, the day they become pregnant, suddenly uh, you know, lack the capacity to really think things through for themselves and understand the nature and consequences of what they're, uh, of a research project. So the focus, we haven't gotten rid of the idea of vulnerability, but we've made it dependent on circumstances primarily rather than status primarily. In Chapter 5, we deal with privacy and confidentiality. 
we have tried to define uh, all information along a range of identifiability, from completely anonymous to clearly identifiable and the parts in between. Um, and we have done uh, these categories, you'll, you'll see, are, are reflected, uh, kind of mirrored in Chapter 12, which deals with human tissue. We have uh, talked about an institutional responsibility to establish security safeguards. And just to note, one of the innovations of uh, the second edition is that wherever we have said there's a responsibility, um, we, we have tried to identify who is responsible. So we've tried to assign roles and said, you know, this responsibility is the researchers, or this is the responsibility of the institution, so that there's more clarity, or this is the responsibility of an REB member, uh, so that it's not enough to just say this ought to be done. We have tried to say who uh, should do it. And in this case, we've talked about uh, the responsibility of institutions to establish security safeguards that will assist researchers in um, maintaining uh, the privacy of research data. Uh, two very important uh, provisions are on the conditions for secondary use of identifiable information without consent. This, as you can imagine, these are exceptional provisions because the default rule is you must obtain consent uh, in order to use uh, people's information uh, for research purposes. Uh, there are a set of fairly stringent conditions that, are, that mirror provisions in privacy legislation throughout this country, both federally and provincially, that would permit the REB not, it's not automatic. You fulfill those conditions, it is still up to the REB to say yes or no to whether they will permit you to do this research without consent. So it is, uh, it is a fairly onerous burden, but what it does is it permits researchers especially those who are accustomed to using large uh, bodies of data that have been collected for another purpose, for example, public health data. If you want to use that data and do research with it, extraordinarily rich source of information for researchers. So this is a way of permitting them to do that research, but ensuring at the same time that the confidentiality of, of those who originally uh, gave their information for another purpose uh, is respected and those people are protected. And of course, as I mentioned before, when, when anonymous bodies of data are linked, or when any two bodies of data are linked, there is the potential for uh, the level of identifiability to increase significantly. So uh, we talk about the need for REB approval where there's been data linkage. Governance is the section that deals mostly with um, the the workings of the research ethics board, how they're appointed, terms, how they make decisions, etc. Um, one thing that we've clarified in uh, Article 6.2, uh, and it's not in the article itself, it's in the application, and I encourage you whenever you're reading this document to read the application sections very closely because that's where we provide some of the sort of richer or, or more nuanced guidance. Uh, and what we have said is there's a distinction between the independence of the REB with respect to the decisions it makes when it reviews research. It's absolutely true, REBs are independent with respect to decision making, but they are also a creature of the institution that created them, and they are accountable to that institution for maintaining uh, appropriate processes, for appointing people, for acting only within the scope of their jurisdiction and not exceeding it, all those normal things. Uh, if the institution is sued and the REB is sued, the REB must disclose its records because it's part of the institution. That's, um, it's not separate from the institution. So that's, uh, I think, an important distinction that was not perhaps always well understood. And I'm just going to uh, use my little polling tool and just to see uh, whether when you come at this, you are a member of an REB, are you a research ethics administrator. We'd like to know um, who we're talking to. And I think we have a nice um, mix, it's looking like, of, of people from all walks of the research community. And another thing is we, we talked about quorum. Um, but we did not have a number set for quorum. We didn't say 50% plus one. 
Uh, and we did that deliberately because when you talk about an REB, say that has to, there is a minimum number of people on an REB because there's a minimum diversity of expertise that we want around the table. You know, a community member, two people f familiar with um, the, the form of, of research that's being discussed. Um, and, and so the usual, someone knowledgeable in law, knowledgeable in ethics. And of course, many REBs are, have far, far more than five members, and they need more than five members because they look at a, lots of different kinds of research. When you're looking for quorum on a particular research study, you don't go around the table and count heads. You go around the table and say, do we have the right mix of people here? Do we have a community person? Do we have someone knowledgeable in ethics, someone knowledgeable in law? And do we have the right people at the table who understand this kind of research? Because you know, having two uh, cancer physicians sitting around the table to review a piece of anthropology research is simply, you don't have quorum. I don't care <laughs> you know, how many physicians you have around that table, that's not quorum. So we have emphasized the need for the relevant expertise. And um, again, this is not necessarily completely new in the second edition, but we've talked about uh, the reporting of unanticipated issues or events. And what we mean by that is um, where there has been uh, an, in an increase in the level of risk uh, because of some development that occurs in the course of the research, you need to know the REB about that. Um, we've used the neutral, neutral terms on anticipated issues and events. You'll find that we don't talk specifically about adverse event reporting. We know there are regulations that relate to that, particularly with respect to clinical trials. We've tried to use more neutral terminology throughout the document because it is a document that's common to uh, not just the health sciences, but also social sciences, humanities, engineering, all of whom may use different terminology. So we've tried to use just uh, uh, very uh, generic, if you like, terms that can apply to any research discipline. So where there's increased level of risk, or in Article uh, 6.16, where there has been a substantive change to the nature of the protocol, you suddenly realize that you know, half the questions you thought you were going to ask turn out to be not that relevant, and you want to ask a different set of questions, or you want to modify the number of times people come to the research site. That's a change that needs to go back to the REB for approval. This is not minor or insignificant things, uh, but things that will actually um, be a change for the participant and that might affect their consent. You need to go back to the REB and, and get uh, approval for that modification. Uh, one new element in, uh, in TCPS2 is with respect to uh, the appeal committee. Um, appeal committees previously had to be uh, permanent committees, which meant that you always had to have um, however many people on that appeal committee hived off and they couldn't sit on the regular REB because they had to preserve their impartiality for the appeal. Uh, that's not the case now in the sense that we offer the possibility of either having uh, a permanent committee or an ad hoc committee. Um, that is, you can select people to sit on an appeal committee uh, when the need arises. And if you're worried about tainting because you know, your, your best ethics person already sits on the REB, what we encourage uh, people to do is look to a neighboring institution and use people from their research ethics board, who of course wouldn't have sat on uh, the, the initial uh, review of the, um, of the study. So we've a lot offered more flexibility, and the other innovation is that we have said that when an appeal committee uh, reviews um, a decision, so for example, a researcher has been rejected, his research has been told it's unethical, and, and um, the modifications that you've made are not sufficient, and we're not going to give it approval, he goes to the appeal committee. The appeal committee um, will not only review that research, but can make its own decision. Uh, about what modifications are necessary, and it can provide approval itself. It doesn't need to send it back to the original REB for review. So the decision of that appeal committee is therefore final.
And we've added a section on publicly declared emergencies and what happens to research ethics board review in uh, the situation of a, a publicly declared emergency. That's obviously a result of the experience with uh, SARS and H1N1. Um, we want REBs to be better equipped to continue to handle research ethics review in a state of emergency. Um, chapter 7 on conflicts of interest, we have added a provision on institutional conflict of interest. And I actually think that probably Article 7.2 is more the, uh, the innovative section. Uh, 7.1 just says that the institution must have conflict of interest policies. But 7.2 introduces the notion that an institution itself may be in conflict of interest sometimes. Um, we discuss the dual role of researchers who may be both, for example, you may be a, a treating psychologist, and you may also be a psychologist who's doing research. And uh, that can present challenges for, uh, for the free and informed consent of, of your patients. So we talk about that in 7.4. And we provide specific guidance with respect to financial conflict of interest. Chapter 8 is an entirely new chapter and one that was much anticipated because uh, researchers across the board are frustrated with the notion that for multi-site review they have to get um, multiple single-site REBs to review their research. Uh, what we've tried to make clear with this new chapter is that that is not a requirement of the TCPS. What we're interested in is uh, that ethics review be done thoroughly and adequately. And if there is a model where that review can be uh, either delegated to a single board or where a joint board can be established or where uh, a central board can be established, uh, whatever the model may be, uh, either regionally or by disease con condition, as with the case of the Ontario Cancer Research Ethics Board, there are many, many models uh, where you can streamline ethics review. And you know, I'm sure you are well aware that there are provincial initiatives underway. Quebec has been a pioneer in establishing a, a model for health research uh, ethics boards, and, and the need to have one principal board established when there's more than, I think, three or four sites involved. So um, we've tried to clarify that that um, that multi-site, uh, multi-jurisdictional research review is not only possible, it's encouraged. And we have set out some examples in the chapter. They are not limitative. It's just, they're just examples. And uh, we leave it to institutions to be creative about how they want to get together, or how groups of researchers want to get together and uh, generate uh, a good model. Obviously, some provincial governments are doing it as well, but those models are restricted to research that's done within one province. So that may not be necessarily terribly helpful for interprovincial research. And we give guidance for research uh, ethics review that's conducted outside of a researcher's institution. Um, another new chapter, and an extremely important one, is Chapter 9, dealing with research involving First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, this chapter, uh, one of the key concepts in this chapter, is the notion of community engagement. Now, that term is very carefully chosen. It is not uh, a case of community consent to research. Uh, this chapter, like all the others, uh, is based on a notion of individual consent to participate in research. But it's an acknowledgment that when you are entering a community, and that may be a community that's formal or territorial or a, a self-defined community of interest, you need as a researcher to get the collaboration of that community. That's just, uh, in a way, that's just good common sense. Uh, if you want people to collaborate with you, you need to earn their trust uh, and understand the terms on which you are going to be working with them. And questions have arisen, well, you know, that sounds good. That, that applies beyond just First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Yes, of course it does. Uh, in any distinct ethnic or cultural community uh, or, or, or any self-defined community, 
it is probably a good idea to get the engagement or collaboration of that community if that community is a central focus of your research. We talk about the nature and extent of community engagement, um, and it's, it's along a spectrum. It depends how much that community is the focus of your research. Uh, it may be actually tangential to your research, in which case the need for engagement is obviously much, much less. Um, we talk about the need to respect community customs. And that includes uh, practices that have grown up around ethics approval. Some communities, uh, certainly First Nations, have established uh, a set of principles for uh, the approval of research um, that, that uh, researchers are going to have to understand and uh, satisfy if they're doing research in First Nations communities. And other, there are other examples. Um, the notion of a research agreement is, is kind of a natural outgrowth once you've engaged with a community and understood and explained the terms and conditions on which you wish to do your research and they have agreed to that. It's good to set that out sometimes in a formal way. Um, and that's, that just contributes to a greater understanding before any problems or misunderstandings have arisen of what I understand to be the terms on which I will conduct my research and what you understand as being uh, the terms and conditions on which you will allow me into your community. So that's what a research agreement is about. We go into more detail on it in, in 9.11. And it's an interesting and, I think, important concept. It will not um, prevent misunderstandings from happening, but it may provide, at the very least, a process for resolving them when they do occur. And I'm, I'm just going to put out another poll there just to see because I have no idea if I'm talking to people who have familiarity with this type of research or not. And I see that um, it seems that the majority of you uh, are not from, have not been involved in, in this type of research, or about two-thirds, one-third, something like that. And when engaging, it's, it's important to look at how relevant uh, the research is to the community needs. That might be one of the most basic sort of things that is of interest to the community and why they will engage with you is, uh, is your research question of, of the least interest or benefit to them, or is it completely uh, not a priority for them? There's also uh, the notion that when you're coming into a community, and again, I don't just mean a geographic community, you need to give some thought to what are you leaving that community with? Are you strengthening their capacity to do their own research? Um, because some of these, uh, some Aboriginal communities are very overstudied or have many, many researchers making demands on their time and their limited resources. So it's important to, uh, to give back in a way if, if that's possible. And uh, we talk about the the extent to which uh, a community representative or the community may participate in the interpretation of results. And that doesn't mean that they will dictate the results, but it may give them an opportunity to provide their interpretation, which can then be reflected in the researcher's results or can be expressed distinctly from the researcher's own interpretation. Chapter 10 is also a new chapter. It deals with qualitative research. Um, there has been an attempt throughout TCPS2 to better reflect the social sciences and humanities, which uh, felt somewhat short-changed short by the first edition, felt it was too heavily weighted towards a biomedical model of research and biomedical research issues. Um, a couple of things that are uh, new. Uh, the notion that pilot studies, uh, th there was some question we saw in our consultations about whether a pilot study really was research and did it require REB review. It is research. It does require REB review. However, uh, often people engage in an exploratory phase before they have actually determined what their research questions will be. And for that, they may engage in some dialogue with uh, potential participants uh, in order to help them shape uh, or design their research. That in itself is not research. It's not every time you go out and have a conversation with someone that you must rush back and get REB review. So we've tried to clarify that distinction between that sort of exploratory phase and a phase where you actually already have your, your research study, but it's just um, you're just carrying it out at the pilot level. Um, 
Here is something that I alluded to earlier, the disclosure of participant identity. While the main thrust of participant protection is to keep information private, information that's been divulged in a research context, to protect the privacy and confidentiality of that information, uh, there are situations where actually uh, the participant wants to be acknowledged for having participated. Uh, they or the group that they belong to want the world to know that they helped with this research and contributed to it. So um, it wasn't clear in the first edition that that was acceptable or uh, even desirable uh, when disseminating research results. And we speak uh, about the requirements for approval of research that uses emergent design. Um, I think there was, again, some confusion about uh, research ethics boards being accustomed, perhaps, to seeing a very set protocols or very set uh, research questions and approving those or not approving those, whereas people who engage in emergent design, the very nature of that research methodology is that you don't have a fixed set of questions at the outset that never change. So uh, this is in response to kind of a, a plea from those in that community to say, look, understand that um, that my research will evolve in the course of it, and that's not a reason not to give it ethics approval. I'm just going to ask you uh, how many of you have been involved in uh, clinical trial research, because that is the subject of Chapter 11. And it looks like a majority of you, a significant majority of you have. Uh, now it's sort of two-thirds. I don't think I can respond to people who have raised their hands, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I just uh, That's uh, one of the limitations of this format is uh, all the questions are going to be for the end. And I'm going to wrap up very uh, shortly so that, to give you an opportunity. We have defined a broader range of clinical trials. There seem to have been a focus on pharmaceutical trials in the last edition. We, we define the range more broadly. We have uh, required that clinical trials be registered, uh, and that's clinical trials starting with phase one trials. All must be registered in a publi publicly uh, accessible web-based registry. Uh, we require um, that there be demonstration of a literature review as part of the justification for proposed research. This is in an effort to avoid duplicating uh, research where a question really has been more or less definitively answered. Um, and there's enhanced guidance about uh, risk that is attributable specifically to research and not uh, associated, for example, with a medical uh, course of care. There seems to be some confusion about what risk an REB is reviewing. It is only reviewing the risk that is directly attributable to the research. We have um, uh, updated guidance on safety monitoring and here too, uh, as I said, we have replaced references to adverse event reporting with uh, a more general discussion of safety monitoring and the reporting of new information. We've repeated guidance on financial conflict of interest in this chapter because it is often so important. Uh, clinical trials often involve private sponsors who are profit-based, and so the potential for financial conflict of interest where there's a potential for commercialization is always enhanced. Um, so we say that clinical trial budgets must be reviewed, not necessarily, by the way, by the REB, but by someone within the institution. And there's an expanded section, a very important one, on the analysis and dissemination of trial outcomes. And this is an attempt to counter, for example, the Olivieri circumstance, where it was felt that a researcher was being uh, muzzled to some extent by uh, conditions imposed by the sponsor on publication. We have tried to make it clear that uh, although there are legitimate reasons why a sponsor can protect, for example, proprietary information, the need for research outcomes to be divulged, for research information to be uh, communicated back to participants where it's relevant, um, that's uh, what's emphasized in 11.12. And uh, the final two chapters on human biological materials and human genetic research, um, not a lot that's new, but we do set out conditions for acceptable research on in vitro embryos. 
and we have incorporated the CIHR stem cell guidelines by reference. We are actually undergoing a process where we hope that the actual guidelines will um, later iteration, I hope by next spring, will actually be found within the TCPS itself. Um, and under human genetic research, we have introduced the need for a plan to manage information that is revealed through genetic research. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we do provide a number of educational resources that we hope will help with the transition to our greater understanding of TCPS2. The, a new interactive and, and much more, we hope, engaging tutorial was launched in June, and we've already had more than 16,000 people uh, go through it, and we hope you will consider looking there. We do provide an interpretation service. You can write into us, and we will answer your questions, and we will also post uh, sort of frequently asked questions online. And this is the first of our webinars, so thank you very much. Here's a list of upcoming webinars, and I am going to now open it for questions. Type away. Who had their hands up will, will now uh, send in the questions. They're all brave guinea pigs because I haven't done this. Um, yes, can a copy of the PowerPoint slides be made available? Um, yes, they can, absolutely. Uh, is the session recorded? Yes, it is, and it will be played. Uh, it will be available on our website in about three weeks, and then we will put it up more or less permanently. Uh, and the French one will similarly up. Um, the distinction between artistic methods that require REB review and those that don't, that's a, um, a bit of a nuanced and specialized area, and we're actually going to be having a webinar on qualitative research where, where that will be addressed down the line. It's not, uh, not on our current list, but um, it's not that our, some artistic methods do require REB and some don't. It's if you're using the artistic method in order to conduct research that you are subject to REB review. If you are simply an artist practicing your artistic activities, you are not subject to REB review. Um, okay. Post the screen with the webinar date. Uh, yeah, we're, we'll do that in just one second. Uh, research and REB member conflict of interest. Sorry, no. um, it's not clear whether all real perceived, potential or perceived research must be disclosed and for REB members that they must absent themselves from all involvement in review. Um, we actually have, uh, that, that question has come up and I, I would say stay tuned to our interpretation site because uh, what we want to clarify is that uh, REB members who, who have a conflict of interest should definitely absent themselves from any discussion of the research uh, that they're connected to. Um, we realize that there, there's the use of the word may in there. The, the chair may ask the person to absent themselves. There's an expectation that the person will voluntarily absent themselves and that if they don't do so, the chair or other REB members can really uh, request that they do so. I think that may be the question you are asking, but we will be posting uh, an interpretation question in the coming week. That, um, does TCPS2 refer to privacy laws? This is not, um, we refer in general to the fact that researchers must respect the laws of the jurisdiction where they are operating. We don't clarify the laws. This is not a place where you're going to get legal advice. Um, so there's no specific reference or detailed reference to uh, to privacy laws. Um, in Chapter 6, the slide, the second bullet was not commented on. Um, let me just see if I can find that one. The second bullet, Chapter 6. Uh, 
Well, there were two. Uh, one was on REB members, Research Ethics Administration staff, maybe non-voting members, if that's the one you were referring to. Um, that's a new provision that just clarifies that if you are a, a staff person, say running the ethics office, you cannot be a voting member of the REB, but if you have the experience and expertise to be an REB member, you may be a non-voting member of an REB. So I, I hope that's what the one that you were referring to. Um, I'll be able to get to all of these. Um, uh, someone has asked whether uh, in the example of categories that may be delegated for REB review, is that list exclusive on page 78? And let me just have an example. No, it is not exclusive. As we say at the outset of that list, these are examples of categories that may be delegated and they include. So it is not an exclusive, uh, exclusive list. Uh, Article 5.5, .5, with respect to the alteration of the consent, sorry, not getting that full question. Um, regarding the clinical trial registry, clinical trials that were currently ongoing prior to TCPS2 and have not asked for a registry number, is it advisable to request this number on the annual renewal? Absolutely, it's advisable. I mean, obviously, the TCPS2 only came into effect on dis in December of 2010, so we were not expecting people to sort of retrospectively rush back. But if there is an opportunity at renewal to, to request registration, that would obviously be very desirable. Um, and how do we define uh, conflict of interest for REB members? Um, participating in a sponsored golf tournament once a year, is that a conflict of interest? Um, you know. It, it's, it's not possible for me to give a definitive, comprehensive definition of conflict of interest. Obviously, you want to look at the extent to which the person has some involvement or whether the nature of, of their, say, familial or, or business relationships would be such as to give the impression of conflict of interest. And, you know, it really depends uh, on the particular circumstances. And the REB itself will have to use its judgment. If, if I were a member and I thought, hmm, research is coming up that I you know, my neighbor is involved in, or my colleague, or uh, my cousin, uh, or I have some financial interest in it, but I, it's not a big financial interest. That needs to be discussed and aired so that um, some consensus can be uh, brought to bear. Um, and, and obviously, disclosing is the first way to address conflict of interest. Disclose and get other people's um, uh, input. Um, Important guidance with respect to communities in the Aboriginal section. Can this also apply to other non-First Nation communities? Yes, I did think that I had uh, had mentioned that, but absolutely, the guidance that you see in Chapter 9 can certainly be used by analogy in other kinds of distinctive communities uh, where you as a researcher may not understand um, or, or, or have a, a large background with that community, you really want to engage with them, earn trust, and, and uh, earn an understanding or develop an understanding of how best to engage. Um, there seems to be a paucity of guidance. This is another question. With respect to the development of databases and or registries, both the US and the EU have been moving forward in this area. Are there any future plans to address this area of research or data collection by the Secretariat? Um, Yes, uh, to some extent, we are, are still developing uh, our sort of evolution priorities uh, going forward. This could be one of them, and I'd be happy if you had some suggestions, if you wrote in to us and made that suggestion. I know that currently um, guidance with respect to public health and epidemiology is one of our key priorities uh, going forward. And I think we are, I'm going to try and take uh, uh, one more question, and then I think we uh, will have Time. Do you feel there will ever be an independent group that would look at collating all uh, serious adverse events in trials, really looking at the big picture of relevance? Uh, you know, an overall group, one uh, one group. I, I don't 
that that's actually feasible. Uh, certainly, um, in, in large trials, there are data safety and monitoring boards. Um, and uh, that's a decision that's made trial by trial. So I'm not sure that that's something, uh, something that the TCPS would be weighing in on. Um, and one last question, can an affiliated board member be a voting member? I have to confess, I'm not sure what an affiliated member is. I thought you were either a full member of an REB, or uh, we do talk about ad hoc members who are just brought in for a particular, uh, for a particular uh, research study because the expertise is lacking, but I'm not sure what an affiliate member is. So if you want to pursue that, or any of you whose questions have not been answered, I would encourage you to write in to the Secretariat, and we will uh, try to get back to you individually. So I thank you very much for participating. I don't want to overstay my welcome. And um, you have been a good guinea pigs. Thank you for, uh, for, for participating in our very first webinar. Bye.